there will be projections are that there will be two billion cars on the roads uh, by 2035. And as we've talked about in the past, right now, the human population around the world is burning 99.9 .9 million barrels of oil every single day of the year. And I think I've given you an appreciation for how much that is as far as content. But if you take 99.9 uh, .9 million barrels of oil, the average barrel of oil is about 20 inches across the diameter of the barrel. And it's a 42 gallon drum essentially. And if you put them side by side, 99.9 .9 million barrels of oil would create a belt uh, over 20, in fact, somewhere around 30,000 miles. In other words, around the equator of the world. The equator, of course, is 25,000 miles. And right now with 99 uh, million barrels of oil, that would even give you an extra 5,000 miles, I suspect. So that kind of gives you an understanding that we're burning a level and that oil is literally dissipating in the atmosphere, the biosphere of this planet in carbon dioxide, uh, particulate, and of course all the other gases that go with it. And that's not, that's not all of it. The, the processing of crude oil takes an extraordinary amount of energy and burning uh, that is also uh, part of the pollution and part of the carbon footprint that goes into the biosphere 24-7. So what I want to really talk about is the ramifications <clears throat> of all of these automobiles and what they're doing. I don't have the, the facts and figures right now, but I think, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, as I've been researching, automobiles kill tens of thousands of people uh, every a year around the world. I'm not sure it's quite a hundred thousand people are killed on the highways of the world, but you can look it up. And in fact, uh, I may look it up during this uh, hour with you, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty close to a hundred thousand because I know in the United States, we lose somewhere around nearly 20,000 uh, people get killed on the highways of America every year. Uh, obviously, you can imagine with uh, the Chinese adding 27 million new cars to their highways every year, they are uh, probably having just as many deaths uh, or more uh, in China. The same thing going on in Europe, the same thing going on in the big cities in Canada, and also in Australia. So these cars, these automobiles, these trucks, all of these modern conveniences are not only killing a lot of people, but they're also doing a, a tremendous amount of damage to the planet. But also understand that all of the oil that is used, and again, uh, as we talked about before, the predictions are that uh, we'll be burning 200 million gallons of oil uh, literally every uh, day uh, by 2030, which is only 11 years from now. And I'm, I'm going to quote you uh, two aspects of what we're really facing, and that's world gridlock traffic. Uh, ben Elton wrote in Gridlock, and I quote, a society sufficiently sophisticated to produce the internal combustion engine has not had the sophistication to develop cheap and efficient public transportation. There are hardly any buses. The trains are hopelessly underfunded and hence the entire population is stuck in traffic. And of course you all know it here in the United States uh, as gridlock traffic. I'm uh, just outside of Denver and I can tell you every time I go into Denver, a city of 2.5 million people, it's a nightmare because you know you're going to run into bumper to bumper gridlock traffic, average over 30 accidents a day. And so it's just a matter of time before you uh, beget, you know, be, become a victim of the accidents of Denver. Can you imagine what it's like in Los Angeles with 11 million people? 
or in New York City with 8.3 million people, or Chicago with around four to five million people, Atlanta, Miami, the, the, the list goes on. And so here's another quote uh, from my own experiences in traffic uh, in Hong Kong, which I've traveled through, in Tokyo, which is a nightmare, Sao Paulo uh, in South America, Sydney, Australia, I've been there, Houston, Paris, I've been there, New York, Los Angeles, I've been through there, Chicago, I've been into Beijing, I've been through Shanghai, Atlanta, San Francisco, and dozens of other uh, overpopulated cities. I can tell you from first-hand knowledge, having been there, uh, that it is a complete nightmare and it only gets worse as we continue to add population. And as I've said, I want to remind you that the human race adds 80 million new babies net gain every year. In fact, I think uh, last year it was 83 million. And I'm quoting here about gridlock traffic. Quote, gridlock traffic causes more deaths, more tension, more suffering and more emotional misery than is yet understood. It defeats the human spirit with endless failure of the ability to move forward. You can be killed or maimed at any moment by another automobile driver. Drivers fume in their seats while their cars fume up the biosphere. Gridlock traffic uh, worsens by the year as humanity grows its collective population by 80 million net gain. Gridlock traffic can never be solved as long as humans refuse to address the root cause of the problem, colon, human overpopulation, unquote. I think that's a very powerful quote. I think it's a very appropriate quote, quote. And I think it's going to, as you can imagine, it's, it simply can only get worse uh, as uh, that's how and what we're facing. Now I'm gonna go over some of the figures here uh, in America, but take them wherever you are and just stick them into your particular situation. Uh, on average, 40,000 Americans lose their lives every year uh, in traffic crashes. In Denver, Colorado, where I live, Gridlock traffic accounts for 25 to 30 crash, uh, crashes every day of the week. Uh, to put Denver's traffic into a few words, an exasperating daily living nightmare. Uh, and of course, uh, there, uh, according to Mothers Against Drunk Driving, uh, a total of 14 million drivers drive drunk on America's highways uh, 12 hour, 24 hours a day. I want you to hear that again. Uh, 14 million American drivers drive drunk. In other words, over the minimum limit of being uh, 20, and that's 7,365 days a year. You might go to morning for an auto crash that takes your life or places you in the ICU at a local hospital. Uh, when you start thinking about how many people are on drugs, and now that we're uh, legalizing uh, marijuana uh, across the United States, I mean, I think New York State's now working to mar legalize marijuana. Marijuana has been legalized in uh, Denver. It's in Washington State, I believe, and a few other states. Well, these kids today who lack uh, any understanding or appreciation for personal accountability and personal responsibility are also out there with those 14 million drunks, and they're stoned. And I'm, I'm a baby boomer myself. I got stoned in my 20s, and I know exactly what it's like to be stoned. You're not in control of your mind. You're off somewhere in an alternative universe. Uh, if you're cocained up, you're also in an alternative universe. If you are uh, in, using any kind of drugs of any kind to alter your brain, or you're on sedatives, or you're on some kind of painkiller. So we have millions of people that are on the highways of America and in Canada and in Europe that are incapable of driving and yet they are driving. Can I ask a question? Oh, yes, by all means. Um, you know, I, I certainly see your problem and your difficulty, but how, how do you control that? I mean, with alcohol, there's, there's certainly, you know, the, the alcohol tests and things like that that they can do when they pull people over. But, you know, with, with things like sedatives and, and marijuana, 
how how can they test for that and and you know how, i mean i i understand that marijuana can be used for a lot of things and and it can mute mute kind of your consciousness to a certain degree if you've smoked too much of it so it should be against the law to drive while under the influence of that as well but how are they going to how are they going to legislate that it would be very simple, actually. I've actually done everything I can here in Colorado uh, to bring very prohibitive laws into effect. Uh, you should, when you s gain your driver's license at the age of 16, you should sign a piece of paper and also watch a movie that shows all of the consequences of driving drunk or driving stoned and a lot of the accidents and show people's you know, bodies and mangled lives and so forth. But you would, should sign or be forced to sign if you're going to enjoy the privilege of, of driving. And that is, if you are caught uh, drinking and driving, you lose your license for a minimum of five years the first time uh, and a, a twenty or thirty thousand dollar fine. In other words, you make uh, the consequences so prohibitive that nobody in their right mind would drink and drive. And you also lose your car, and you have to pay for uh, the car being stored uh, for those five years. Well, you can't use it. And if you a friend lets you drive a car, that person also loses their car for that period of time. So that'll stop anyone from lending their car to somebody who's going to drink and drive. I think the same thing would work if you are uh, using marijuana or the, any uh, mind-altering drug. Uh, and so uh, what you do, and then, of course, your insurance rates would just be unbelievable. I don't care what they are, $20,000 a year or more. So you make the consequences so prohibitive that once these 14 million people who are drunk on the highways 24-7 in the United States start finding their, uh, and then if they then drink, uh, or then they take their license, even though the license is gone, uh, and then they drive again, then they're fa facing jail time. And that would be the way to solve it, because obviously nothing else has solved drinking and driving in this country. Nothing thus far has solved uh, marijuana smoking and driving. And so uh, the only way to deal with it would be a very harsh, uh, prohibitive way uh, of taking the car away and, and literally taking your driver's license. And if you do it a third time, uh, a second time, uh, your driver's license uh, is gone for 10 years. Uh, and then a third time, your license is gone for the rest of your life. Uh, and of course, you would be in jail absolutely automatically for a one to three year period. I mean, that's the kind of consequences that people listen to and then actually would uh, adhere to. Uh, and then the ones that don't, they are going to be sitting in jail, which I'll be happy to pay their three meals a day in a cot because I don't want my uh, kids and I don't want my wife uh, in an accident by somebody who's drunk and, and or stoned and, and they kill my family members. I'm willing to pay the jail fees for those kinds of individuals. Does that make any sense? It, it makes a great deal of sense. Is this something the state would legislate or would this be a federal legislation? I personally would like to see it to be a state, but also a, a federal uh, legislation so that everyone had to comply no matter what. Uh, one way or the other, I guarantee you that if we had that kind of law on the books, we would drop uh, the, uh, right now, it's, I think last year was 17,000 deaths from alcohol on America's roadways. Uh, and it would stop all of the other injuries. I mean, think of the, there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of injuries. We need to be, oh, I do the same thing with uh, with uh, cell phones. If you're caught texting uh, on the highways, because right now 11,000 texting accidents each year and 4,100 deaths uh, mm -hmm. uh, from texting uh, messages uh, while driving 60 and 70 miles an hour. So I would put the same onus and consequences on anyone who is texting and driving as I would on alcohol and or drugs. And, and that, that unfortunately, is the only way to stop it because everything else, we've had DARE, we've had alcohol programs, we've had, we've had everything under the sun, and nothing will stop people from drinking and driving and doing, getting stoned and driving or texting and driving 
unless it's personally going to cost them more than they're willing to uh, pay uh, in the consequences. Well, the texting and driving I see all the time. I mean, oh, I know. It's everywhere. It's it's fr my son is a lawyer and I don't think he can he can go to the bathroom without his cell phone on him so he can keep talking to people you know no matter what he's doing where he is and uh, it, it bothers me greatly but you know we put this kind of technology out there and do we draw it back do we do we take away the ability to connect your phone to the car so that you can talk back and forth while you're driving i mean a lot of this stuff we've we've brought on ourselves i mean take away the tech and take away the possibilities and the potentialities and then you have some control over some of it but but the driving drunk um you know ever since alcohol there's been people that are going to abuse it and it's the same with marijuana and it's the same with a lot of your other drugs um it, it's it's difficult to to regulate things that are, are free out there for people who have no common sense to abuse. Well, and that's the same reason why uh, we put people in prison for killing people. If you murder somebody, homicide one, uh, or even uh, you know uh, manslaughter two, uh, you're going to pay a consequence. And, and, and if those people are not going to be personally accountable or personally responsible, then absolutely you, you have a consequence that is extraordinary. And as I said, strike one is the first time you drink and drive and you're caught, uh, you, uh, you know, whether it's a roadside catch or you're in an accident, automatic losses, you're licensed for five years, you know, a ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 fine. Uh, and then when you, uh, you know, your car is impounded to make sure you don't drive it. It's, you know, and right on down the line, you make these things so harsh, uh, you do the same thing with texting. So it, it will make people responsible. And the ones it doesn't make responsible, which is whatever percentage that is, they simply sit in a jail cell until they get their head straight. Uh, what about now, what about like what about like this 14 year old who um, was was out? driving around with his friends and, and, and he obviously didn't have a license. He hit a car and he, he killed two people. I mean, you know, you have something like this. I mean, he didn't, he wasn't even licensed to drive and yet he has killed people. Um, you know, if you make if you make an example, you know, if you make an example of somebody like this, then this might work. In Switzerland, well, there was a case no, last no. year. Uh, sorry, I'll just, I'll just uh, interject here. For just one little thought. It was really sure. interesting. I uh, read in the news last year, I guess, in Switzerland, some rich guy was speeding, and he got fined. They, I guess they fine them by a percentage of what they get paid every year. And so this guy got fined 300,000 something francs for speeding. <laughs> so that's, I think, that, that's good. That, and that's a good, that's a, a good uh, comment. You have to make the consequences more prohibitive. And consequential than than the uh, the freedom to go do uh, the drinking and driving, uh, you know. And you know, I'm a I'm a litter picker upper. I, and one of the things, in fact, this morning I was just picking up uh, I-70 coming out of Denver. I live 35 miles from Denver, and there's two big rest stops where I where I I live. Well, I live a minute from, and I'm always picking up. Literally, what is my biggest uh, pickup? Uh, cases of empty cores, uh, cases of uh, Pat's Blue Ribbon, cases of beer, uh, uh, bottles of wine, uh, certainly whiskey bottles, uh, all those little shooters that you get from the airports. Those are my biggest uh, pickup of trash along the highway. So you can imagine uh, all these people that are drinking and driving, and of course they toss their cans of, uh, or bottles and, or shooters or their plastic whiskey bottles. And I'm telling you, it's, it's extraordinary to me. Uh, and, and so, uh, again, we're just not either brave enough or smart enough to make the consequences uh, more, uh, more uh, really harsh. You know what might work? If we, a lot of the roads out here, I, mean, I live in Connecticut, we, we used to have toll roads here. What if instead of, I mean, what about reinstating the tolls and instead of having them pay, have a breathalyzer every time you go through? Well, that would be, that's like trying to fix the, the problem after the accident's already happened. Uh, again, start the, start the solution in the front end of the problem. In other words, you sign a piece of paper when you get your driver's license 
And this paper shows that you understand that if you drink and drive, you will lose your license for five years, your car for five years, you'll pay the impound fees, you'll pay the towing fees, and you're going to pay no less than twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year for insurance, which is mandatory once you get your license back after five years. And if you should drive in between time, you'll be sitting in jail. Uh, again, make make it so harsh that nobody would in their right mind. And then the ones that are out of their right mind, they're going to be sitting in a jail cell and or you know in a debtor prison for the rest of their lives. So uh, that that's you know that that again. There must be another five solutions, but they've got to be very harsh. Well, I, I told, I told, are you still there? Yeah, I'm right there. <laughs> okay, it, uh, things went fuzzy for a minute there, um, and I haven't been drinking anything. Um, <laughs> Well, I have to say here in Canada, driving has certainly gotten a lot worse, I've noticed, in the last few months since they legalized pot. <laughs> I have to admit. Well, I've noticed in Denver, Colorado. I can imagine. It's crazy. And I saw just the other day we were at a kid's event, and, uh, man, the, the amount of adults smoking pot around their kids, it was probably at least maybe 100 adults there smoking pot. You couldn't get away from the cloud. It was just awful. I just thought, geez, I mean, isn't there any common sense here whatsoever? It's un un unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. Well, I would agree with you. Here, and here's a quote from the United States National Highway Traffic Administration. Car accidents occur every minute of the day. And here's the quote. Motor vehicle accidents occur any part of the world every 60 seconds. And if it's all summed up on a yearly basis, there are 5.25 million driving accidents that take place annually in the United States. Statistics show that each year 43,000 or more of the United States population die uh, due to vehicular accidents and around 2.9 million people end up suffering light or severe injuries. In a certain five-year period, uh, there had been recorded a 25% of the driving population who encountered or were involved in car accidents. It also affirmed that car accidents kill a child in the United States every three minutes, unquote. So this, and here's the one for Canada, since you're in Canada. The Canada Free Press reported, and I'm quoting, Here's one way to get attention. Traffic deaths worldwide kill the equivalent number of people as would perish in nine jumbo jet crashes every year. Think of the headlines for nine jet crashes every day of the year. World traffic injuries are taking the lives of 100, no, of four, 145 people every hour, every day, totaling 3,500 deaths per day. This is more than a two a minute and adds up to something like 1.3 million people dying on the world's highways and roads each year and further 20 to 30 million people suffering injuries and often debilitating ones, unquote. That was from the Canada Free Press. You know something, this goes right back to what this show, if Mark were here, um, was going to talk about and, and it's de depopulation. Do you think that they have they have uh, not come down hard on the drinking and not come out you know, and and are making uh, marijuana legal and stuff like that. Do you think that this is part of a depopulation program? Because it sure as hell sounds like it's working. Well, I, I wouldn't. I, I in the end, I don't think that there's any kind of a, a um, how a harsh depopulation. Uh, a gang or a, a depopulation group. Uh, you know, I've heard Agenda 21 from the United Nations and so forth. What what I would like to see is that the, the, the world leaders, and I've said this before, get together at a national conference and an international conference, first a national conference in each country, and start talking about the fact that we need to gracefully, through birth control, lower the human population uh, via one child per mother uh, worldwide in, in the coming uh, decades in order to bring the world population down to less than one billion so that we would have a viable 
a planet, viable biosphere, viable oceans, and viable uh, environments so that we as the human race uh, could uh, thrive instead of what's going on. Uh, and for me, that, that would be a much more intelligent thing than creating some kind of a, a violent system where we die because we have so many people drinking alcohol or getting stoned or whatever. Uh, so it's, pro that's it's probably just for profit. It's probably just for profit. I mean, you know, there's people making money off this stuff, so that's usually that's the only answer in the end. <laughs> well, and, and that's the tragedy because no question about it, the beer companies make all their money uh, and all the bars make all of their money and everybody drives to all of these places to get all of this booze. Uh, and, and so there's no question that there is an extraordinary amount of, of irresponsibility and lack of personal accountability uh, throughout not only the United States and Canada, but all over the world. So until we get a hold of that, then the rest of and I don't drink personally, uh, but the rest of us are going to uh, pay the price with these statistics that I just gave you. That's a lot of people dying on the highways of the world. Frosty, I'll give you a law enforcement perspective. I retired about three years ago, but you know, the, the problem is all the budgetary constraints we have nowadays. And I remember just going call to call, and you really didn't have time to be taking yourself off the road for doing traffic control stuff. Uh, and you know that's just where I was at in a, in a rural county setting. But um, and then did I make drunk driving a restaurant? Sure, you know, but. It wasn't like when I first started where you could get three at night and no problem. I mean, our staffing got cut, everything else got cut, and that's that's pretty much all across the board. I mean, a lot of agencies I know, they, they were slaughtered, you know, in these budgetary times that we have. So you're doing the best you can with a skeleton crew, and you're trying to save your manpower to go to hot calls, you know, domestics, things like that. And But, I, you know, you do. You see an increase in, in accidents and everything else because they, they know. They don't see as many police officers out there. Well, it, and it, yeah, and yeah, thank you for your service as a police officer. And of course, my brother Howard was a police officer for 20 years, so I know all the same stories from my brother and the staffing of, you know, situations. And, and unfortunately, out there on the highways, there are really a lot of people. I mean, I hate to say this, but when you, you think about all the dumb kids that got through high school or the ones that dropped out of high school, uh, and, and, and those kids uh, grew into a world with a lack of personal accountability and a personal responsibility. They're susceptible in their lives uh, to, from the fact that they're, they're working a lousy job. Uh, they're not making much money. Uh, they're driving a lousy car. Uh, they're in a lousy situation. Uh, what's the nicest thing you can do? Well, you can get stoned and you can get drunk. And that kind of takes you away from your problems for a short amount of time. And obviously, we have millions of people out there on the highways doing it. And, of course, the phenomenon of the smartphone and texting while well, you're going 70 miles an hour or 60 or 40 or 30. And, in fact, when I pull up the stop signs or pull up the stoplights uh, near my home, everybody, I, I'd say 9 out of 10 people are texting right there at the stop sign. So and that's, so, that's so hard to prove. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that's, that's the problem. When you're in a patrol car and it's fully marked, you, you don't see it as much. I, I see it all the time in an off-duty vehicle, you know. But when you're in a cruiser, people put that stuff away or they don't use it as much, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, because they can see. Well, right. That's where you need, uh, you, know, you know, brown paper wrappers. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, I mean, I used to be an over-the-road truck driver for United Van Lines uh, in the summers. And uh, boy, oh boy, I got to see a lot. And you as a police officer, you got to see a lot. I mean, I saw every kind of crack up. I saw every kind of drug use. I got, I saw 18-wheelers plow into bridges, into concrete abutments. I saw drivers go to sleep. Uh, I certainly went to all the truck stops, you know, Flying J, uh, you, you name it, uh, the truck stop whores. I mean, <laughs> one of the things, I, I think I got more education as a long-haul trucker for United Van Lines in all the years I worked in the summers than I did any other way because you really get to see humanity and how it operates. And so, you know, as a police officer, you know, and I've had other police officers I've talked to because I, I talked to a lot of the guys I work out at gym and they're, they're already still police officers and also of EMTs that I work out with. Uh, I, I know I made a very didactic, if you will, a statement on how to cure uh, drunk driving and texting and certainly marijuana usage and so forth. 
you as a police officer, uh, does that seem like something that would work or is there something else that you would have that would be better or, or is it a hopeless situation and that human nature is going to win out in the end and people are going to drink no matter what and they're going to get stoned no matter what and they're going to text no matter what? That's an interesting question because I look at it and say when things get the worst, right, when the economy tanks, what's the mm -hmm. one thing that keeps selling? Booze, you know? I mean, people... <laughs> well, more so because right? yeah. you can fund your troubles. Right. So, I mean, it, it's just that cause and effect loop coming into it, you know, where you, you have more and more people. Um, you know, what we need is to get to the root of the problem. And what's that? You know, you got to be able to think properly. You got to be able to live your life properly. And this gets just it just gets more and more difficult with more and more stressors that we have. You know, that's one of the things, you know, as a former teacher that I found and I have found now as I, you know, lived through my life. And I'm looking back on it. I mean, I still think I have 10 more years, uh, a pretty viable life. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I just went skiing yesterday. I went bicycling today <laughs> after I worked out and went swimming. But, but for me, uh, at some point, that's correct. The stressors are there and they're getting more stressful. And, and the world is going faster. And the computers are driving us a little more crazy as we go. Uh, and again, for me, whether it's in Canada or whether it's in America or, or literally anywhere, somehow we have got to move as, as civilization, civilizations, as, as uh, countries, uh, as cities and communities. We really, I think, have to get back to basics. And the, the basics are body, mind, and spirit. You, you've got to take care of your body, number one. Uh, and, and feed it and exercise it. Uh, and you also have to uh, mind, you've got to go to the mind, you've got to feed the mind. Uh, you've also got to choose or be able to choose a job that fits your, your highest and best as a human being so that you're a happy human being. I think we need to get to that in the high schools, uh, even in grade schools, so that we, we help move individuals toward living a, a, an intellectual life as best that they can uh, toward uh, the best that they can academically because uh, I taught in the elementary, I taught in high school and I taught in college and then move uh, toward uh, a, a, a job or a, a, an academic uh, you know, future where you're happy. Uh, and when you're happy, you're not out there being irresponsible. You're actually being uh, responsible and accountable uh, because that's the way your life needs to go. And then, of course, the spiritual aspect Body, mind, and spirit. However, each person takes uh, you know life on spiritually, whether it's religion or whether it's Buddhism or whether it's uh, agnosticism. I really don't care. But as long as they keep a balance, uh, and so they they're not out there drinking their brains out because they're unhappy, or they're not stoned because they don't have anything else to do. So, um, if you can live a virtuous life, whether you know whatever your faith is or belief yeah. structure, if you're living by a virtuous life, well. That's, to me, the cure. You know, I mean, we can look at penalties and we can look at all these things, but in the end, does, does that always work? No. But if we can get people to think properly and have a good outlook on life and live, lead a virtuous life, well, I think we might get more results. But no, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. And, but where does it have to start? Because, you, you know, you have a society today that is not functioning that way. Right. So, so you, have, you have to start with... The children and the schools. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I taught school for 25 years as well. So, okay. I, the school systems are set up to dumb our kids down. So you're going to have to change the whole school system to to start working towards where their their talents and gifts are and and enhancing those so that you raise happy functional adults at some point in time because you you can't start with it, it would be a good idea too i know there are adults out there that are trying to get into the body mind spirit balance and and they're doing a great job but it's a, it's a small number of people and and in order to put this into practice, and I think you're absolutely dead on with, with what it will take to create a society that way, but you have to start real young, and, and the school system is something that the government isn't going to let you touch. You know, the, I, grew up, I grew up in a very small town in Canada, 
and it was very different when I was a kid growing up. People would come here, and it was a lot less stressful. The real estate was a lot cheaper. You know, people could uh, just have a good job and uh, pay off their bills and whatever, and not just live for that. But nowadays, you have to have ten roommates just to manage two jobs, you know, and uh, that just uh, two crappy jobs, and, and it's just not the world I grew up in at all, and I can definitely see there's a huge difference, and uh, it's not just an economy thing, it's, it's definitely, you know, there's more people, and uh, there's less place to put them anymore, and so they're scrounging, you know, trying to find places for them, and the places that are left over are not as nice as the ones that, you know, when the people first started coming here, and all that kind of thing, so... Um, yeah, the stress is, I see, you know, like I was a musician growing up and uh, I was able to practice, you know, um, because I lived out in the boonies and there was no neighbors. But the kids that uh, I grew up with, a lot of them lived in town, you know, um, townhouses and that sort of thing. They couldn't practice music and, uh, you know, it just, it, it definitely affected their life, like hugely, hugely. Like they, it's it's just so concrete, um, the, the, the results out of uh, overpopulation and just being stuck together in these communities, you know, and this sort of thing. And it, it just doesn't function. It doesn't work. People can't really grow up to be neutral, to be themselves, to be uh, trying things. And, out, you know, I was driving a truck when I was nine years old, you know, on the fields uh, with, you know, getting oats off the fields, oat bundles and stuff with a big trailer. And, uh, you know, you just don't see that in the... You don't get those kinds of experiences. You don't see what it's like to go hunting and to respect the natural, the natural uh, cycles of, of things. So that you can go back next year and, and still be able to enjoy it um, rather than destroying it all, or you know, all those kinds of things. If that's not there, fat chance. You know, you just you, you won't uh, be able to understand in, intrinsically what really happens in the natural laws. So when I first went to Vancouver for the first time, I, it blew my mind. I thought, how the hell can these cities even exist? And and to think that Vancouver is tiny compared to a lot of cities out there. <laughs> and there's so many of them. And I just thought, how the hell can this function? It's just, no, it can't function. There's no way it can. There's no way it can. So here we have still, you know, pretty relatively small town, but, you know, the sewer st system's overflowing, and they don't know what to do. The whole town stinks half the time whenever the wind blows a certain direction, and, you know, all this kind of stuff is going on, and I just think to myself, oh my God, I mean, this is not the design of intelligent people, you know? This is just people living their stupid lives doing stupid things and they don't even question what they're doing they're just doing it and uh, it's just un unbelievable so yeah I'm totally with you on that now. as an old farm boy myself when I was driving that old 49B uh, John Deere tractor uh, and know that hard work thing myself and cutting the chickens heads off after you fed them and uh, yeah. raised them and, and all that goes with that and, and plucking them uh, you get common sense uh, but you also get purpose, and you also get a grounding in nature, and you get, uh, you know, the seasons come and go, and there's no question, but you, you look at the big cities, let's face it, cities are completely, uh, and John Muir said it way back in 18, uh, you know, 70, 1890, 91, in some of his writings, there's not a perfectly sane man in all of San Francisco, <laughs> it's because everything is cabled and taught. And, and, and because it's so taut, everybody's strung up and they're a little bit insane. And, and so you, these kids are growing up in the middle of these concrete jungles. They they don't. They think milk comes from a carton. They, they think food comes – and they don't even know what food is. It's just something that they buy or whatever. And they're not in touch with uh, uh, the natural world. They're not in touch with themselves. And their, their biorhythms are completely out of whack. And, and so what, what do they do? Well, they get stoned, they get drunk, they smoke, they smoke, uh, smoke uh, cigarettes, they do any kind of drugs they can uh, because they were already crazy in the first place as they were uh, you know, gr growing up. So, you know, I'm glad that we, we have some of us have been teachers and certainly have come off that farm because one of my most thankful things is I'm a farm boy in Michigan. I came off the farm. I worked my tail feathers off, you know, and I got to go to college and, uh, and, and had a sense of self. And I had good parents who were balanced. So we, we need to teach, uh, like, parents that are going to have, you know, kids. They need to have parenting classes. We need to have kids that grow up with the choices to go into something that is meaningful to them. Because every 
I, I, in fact, Dan Millman wrote The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. He's been a friend of mine for 25 years. And uh, there are 37 pathways uh, to life. And, and literally, I'd say 80 plus percent of high school students get out of high school. They stagger into life. They stagger through high school. They stagger into life. And they don't know what they're doing or how to get where they want to go because they have no clue. Uh, I would like to see more uh, teaching in high schools on how to move toward your most productive life. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book about it. It's called uh, Living Your Spectacular Life. And I, I give 12 concepts and practices uh, on how to move toward what turns you on, what makes you feel whole, what makes you feel good, what, what gives you balance. And, and I think we need more of that teaching so that all these kids that are so lost and so staggering into their late mm -hmm. teens have a chance to find out what makes them a productive, positive, accountable, and responsible person. Does that make sense? Of course, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was uh, certainly not coming out of high school in flying colors at all. Actually, I dropped out, so. <laughs> and I was suicidal and everything else, you know, but I avoided the drugs and the alcohol, thank goodness. Most, for the most part, I drank a little bit, but uh, after after high school, and uh, that was just a couple times, you know, to get the buzz going for the music, but I uh, realized it didn't work after the second night. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, yeah, got over that pretty quick, and uh, yeah, no, I um, I totally hear you, man, and I wish it was easier to find that stuff. I really had to work my tail off just to find what you're talking about, and, uh, and uh, you know, I found it in my own way, and I don't know if you heard any of the other shows, but uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, it's still, you know, it's, a, it's something that should be easier to find in our world, and it's just so lacking, and I, I find even a lot of my family members, you know, and so on, friends that I grew up with in high school and so on, that... You know, I, I can't stand being around them just because they, they're just dead from the neck up, you know, and they're, yeah. they're totally into the drugs and they're totally into the alcohol and all that stuff. And they're not doing anything with their life. They're having the same conversations, exactly the same conversations that they had 15 years ago. And I, I, I can't believe it. It's really hard to believe. <laughs> it's hard to watch. Well, it's painful, especially when you're, you, you, you know, I've gone back to, to my 55th reunion and all that goes with it. And the ones that did poorly lived very poor lives. They were, you know, cashiers at a three blonde diner in the sticks and never got out of that. And they, they get to watch TV and see all the extraordinary stuff going on TV, but they never got to participate themselves. And, and uh, the rest of them were used car salesmen and or truck drivers and or, you know, meaningless jobs that just simply got a paycheck. Uh, and, and so there's no question we need to get into the educational fields and actually uh, educate children from uh, from the you know right from first grade on up to move toward their highest and best and what is uh, their contribution and what is their best contribution because of those 37 pathways of life and wouldn't that be fantastic but of course unfortunately we've got all the money being spent on the military I mean my god the money that's spent on the military here in the United States is beyond sickening uh, and, mm -hmm. and all the absurd wars that we're fighting, whether it was from Vietnam, or, uh, whether it was Korea, those are all bankers' wars, and big people mm -hmm. with big money or have all the power. Same thing going on with Afghanistan and Iraq and, and the next war that they're planning. You know, And so uh, I, I think in the end it has to be at the individual level, uh, in education at the community level, and the, and the states and the provinces uh, of each country uh, and we've got to take a, we got to get a handle on it uh, uh, locally. And I guess that to me is about the only way we're going to be able to solve it. And I'm not sure that we have the, the fortitude or the wisdom enough uh, to do that. Uh, it's obviously not happening across both Canada and America right now. Hmm. Well, I got to run, but you guys keep chatting. It's fantastic talking to you. Oh, nice to meet you. My name's Daniel. <laughs> and, yeah, thank you. All well, right. Have a good I'm time. hoping, uh, Daniel, we, I hope this conversation that people are listening to, uh, you know, across the country, across Canada, I, I hope we create discussions. I hope there's folks that are listening to this that have an understanding and then start talking at the diners and talking at at the city councils. I, I'm going to my city council here another week and trying to get the golden uh, population stabilization policy passed. 
And, and, and the boy, they, they're sitting there with their deer in the headlights. They just they can't even imagine. And I said, well, do you keep wanting more gridlock traffic? Do you want to have more air pollution with every breath that you're breathing? Do you want to be crammed and jammed in the streets of, of Golden, Colorado, like they are in Denver? And, and they're going, yeah, we don't, you know, do we want to have I, I-70 gridlocks and nobody can go camping or skiing on the weekends? Uh, but to get them to move on that is like trying to move. Uh, I feel like I'm Sisyphus. <laughs> <laughs> it's like trying to raise the Titanic with tweezers, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <I> hear you. <laughs> well, you know, it's becoming to the finish of this uh, consequences of overpopulation, and certainly uh, on so many levels. Uh, this is Jason Brent from Los Angeles, Nevada, a friend of mine. He's a de demographic uh, expert, and he said, and I'm quoting here, and he said, so what's the answer? Therefore, the, the only problem, the ultimate problem facing humanity is to reduce our population as quickly as possible with the least amount of death and destruction and to determine who will uh, be permitted to produce when the population contraction commences in the very near future. He's talking about human die-off uh, because of starvation rates. Compared to the problem described above, above, every other problem faced by humanity is irrelevant and unimportant. If the problem described above is not solved, billions will die due to the decline of economic activity, loss of oil, and or which will cause continuous wars and other horrors until the population is reduced to the level uh, of the declining economic activity, activity that can support it, unquote. Uh, in, in, we talked about it last week. We keep going on this path. There's no question. It's an absolute guaranteed biological fact that these civilizations will collapse at some point and we and or our kids will be in those civilizations and i would say it's a whole lot smarter to be proactive and productive in preventing that by taking another path by choosing another route in order to get to the future and, and of course as i said we need to go to one child per woman worldwide and it needs to be agreed upon by all the world leaders and all the environmentalists and especially all of the religious leaders around the world because if they don't and we don't then the darwin solution uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse will be the solution that's going to engage us whether we like it or not how will you enforce something like that i mean yeah no, you don't you, I, I don't think we can enforce it uh, what i what i'm hoping is a national international discussion uh, that we bring to uh, the religious leaders and all the, uh, the in environmental leaders and then all the world leaders say that, hey, the human race needs to have one child per woman worldwide starting now, and that's what we need to move toward, and we have to do it intelligently, uh, because if we don't, then again, uh, I don't think we can f enforce it. But I think if we get it on the plate and we start advertising it and we start using all of the powers of education, because your first world countries are already there. Um, uh, the first world countries have always, uh, since 1970, they've been having only two children of, or less per woman. And so it's possible to do it. And so again, it, gets, it has to be the educated countries have to lead and then the, the trickle down effect, if you will, uh, into the other countries and as their consequences grow and those consequences are going to grow we're going to add another three billion people here in the next 30 years around the planet somebody's going to get a clue that hey we can't keep going on this path i i you know, I, I hear what you're saying and i it, it makes it makes sense it's just you you think of um places where where um there is no birth control. There is, a, I mean, you know, I'm thinking third world countries here. Right. Uh, preventing them from, I mean, if you get all of the educated countries doing this, then you have a mass of uneducated people that are going to go wacko with it. And before you know it, you're going to have a global confrontation of, you know, the haves and the haves nots, and the have nots are going to have a lot more than the haves. So it well, could yeah. get. There, there's no question we're going to have global confrontation and it's already coming at us mm -hmm. uh, that, that's that, that's a fact it's coming all right thank you so much frosty for your wisdom and barbara we appreciate it barbara, uh, thank we're going to be closing out the show today and i want to take thank uh, solana daniel as well thanks